The market is changing. Can your business keep up? Join me, Justin Lane, and a host of enterprise sales talent as we unravel the world of sales incentives and technology to help you become a more agile and effective leader. Learn how best-in-class organizations use data to identify and apply the right incentives at the right time to drive organizations towards success, whatever the market throws at you. Quit the guesswork and unlock the full potential in your sales team. Welcome to the Sales Compensation Show. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome Christopher Goff to the show today. Chris is a certified compensation professional with over 15 years of experience in sales operations and compensation functions, everything from quota setting, salary structures, sales compensation design, as well as he is an author, which always is impressive to me. He currently works at LabCorp and does some advising on the side. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. For the folks on that are listening that maybe aren't familiar with your background, can you tell us a little bit about the last 15 years and how you got into sales compensation and what are you up to today? Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. A lot of on-the-job training, I would say. Did not plan to get in sales comp, as I suspect so many uh, are in that same boat. I uh, was essentially a business analyst doing a lot of reporting, and it evolved into a need to do quotas and target setting for like the sales organization. And I, and I kind of grew up in sales ops, but sales ops meant, meant a lot of things back then, you know, because I was in finance, I was in HR, I was in ops, and I was in underneath sales, right? And so it, it evolved into so many of those, like quite literally taking the map and drawing out territory lines based on market data, you know, like starting from that era and building quotas. And sales comp just happened to be part of the job, right? Not that I knew what I was doing, mind you, but it was kind of like, here's what we have and let's tweak it year to year based on whatever it is, like new jobs that come out and all that sort of good stuff, right? And it wasn't until I went into compensation more broadly that I really learned some of the uh, the basics, right? I had an appreciation for psychology. So my background before that was economics. And so I do believe people respond to incentives and that drove at least some of the comfort level of being able to play the game, if you will, of, of uh, what is so much in terms of design, right? Like we tweak one thing, we find out, does that work? How do people respond? How does, how does it work in, in terms of communication and all that, all the rest of the story, right? Which I, which I again, kind of grew our appreciation with when I moved into broad-based compensation as well. And so that's some of my, my story. I, I kind of picked up the, the background and the education formally, uh, like after the fact, like after the first decade or so of, of doing the work and, um, and then uh, moved, moved to, to be able to focus on that. And, and kind of my more recent job has been just to focus on supporting the commercial organization for LabCorp globally. And a couple years ago, like during COVID, in a, in a desire to want to socialize with other people, I spent a lot of time just reaching out to my network. And I came across a just an old sales leader who said, I, am, I, I do this advisory work for non uh, nonprofit, and they're hiring their first salesperson. And it gave me a reason to then think about like everything I take for granted, right? All of the stuff that I that I think of and really digging into the why. That was a big that was a big part of it. So that that is what evolved into the uh, the authorship part of which is more of my recent uh, recent past. Okay. So a lot of things uh, to dive into or unpack there. I want to pick on one thing first and then we'll we'll, we'll kind of go down the list. So sales operations. So you have kind of seen this rise of sales ops. And now I see, you know, people are transitioning into revenue ops. Do you feel that's where sales compensation design and or administration should live within an organization? Or do you have any opinions on that? Definitely have an opinion on on um, some parts of it, because I think it makes a lot of sense for it to to live in rev ops. It's kind of the 
place where it should be uh, disconnected from the rest rest of the org. And I, I would say my opinion on this on on this particular topic is that there are parts of compensation broadly that have to be accounted for, and in a lot of cases that that is best served to be an HR. And that's that's the holistic comp. And so what the one of the th- problems that I've seen over the years is that people have a tendency to just look at their own little piece and then they miss the rest of it. So we have these broader problems of like job content or base salaries that aren't that can't possibly be addressed by like a RevOps type of area, right? And so some of that is where if you have really good partnership, it can sit anywhere, right? But I would say that it makes a lot of sense because what's what's missing many times in, in HR is a, an appreciation for really driving the business, like really needing to move and respond very, very quickly to the needs of the business to to implement design and make that right that that, that sort of desired outcome effective, right, as, as quickly as possible. So that's, there's an agility that comes with RevOps, which is appreciated. You have a master's degree in economics. Yes. We've talked to people over the course of the season with all sorts of educational backgrounds. I think you're the first to me that has something that is directly applicable, or at least feels so. What learnings were you able to bring from your academic background into the world of sales comp? Yeah, so so the uh, the unbeknownst to me has been beneficial. There is an appreciation for data to start off with, right? And how that data is connected to the way in which people respond to incentives. I would say that the simplest, like most under uh, underlying component, is is the logic of economics rather than the math of economics. And what I mean there is is that if you appreciate some some of the old school uh, philosophical components. It's an understanding, really diving deeper into the way in which things work. And that's the way I like to approach sales compensation. And I and I try to look at it in maybe even a, a bit of a contrarian point of view. There's an old, old joke about the one-armed economist and the ability to make a decision, right? And that's the that's the, the thing. I always tend to look at things of the, well, what are our, all of our possible candidates associated with this problem that we're trying to address. And a lot of it is is uh, digging into those different options, right? With a, with a point of view that is, I am trying to think of the ways in which people can make decisions. And based on this information, kind of holding Sater's Paribus, holding all other things constant, what I'm trying to dig into is those, those particulars, right? Whether that's clarity of, of the role, an understanding of of actions, responsibilities, compensation itself, the more holistic components of compensation, which include base salary, other allowances, and variable, and and even the the mechanics of pay, right? Not just the how do I know what I, what I need to do in order to act, but also within the plan, the crediting, the governance, considered fair, and then the cash, right? It, there's reasons for people to act, but then if they also don't get paid in a reasonable or perceived to be fair methodology, then you have some of the rest of the challenges. So I, I do tr- I do try to, or I believe that the economics is, has helped me try to look at things in a, in a di- bit of a different way than others. So you, you brought that, what I consider a great foundation to the table. Everything you talked about just there, the idea of data, logic, how people make decisions, a little bit of philosophy uh, to the table, uh, maybe you know more on the humanistic side of, of sales compensation. I think that's a great foundational start. Then you mentioned something about you know learning through experience, trial and error. Besides that kind of on the job, figuring things out as you went, how else did you pick it up? Did you have any good mentors over the years? Was there? How did you acquire knowledge around what was good and, and maybe what wasn't? Yeah. I would say Donya Rose was hap- happened to be an individual that I uh, learned a lot from something from early engagements with her and her and the Signal Group back way back in the day. So it's about 2007. I learned quite a bit of an appreciation for what would be more of the process, unpacking what that what it really meant 
in all of the points of decisions that go into a process that I think is really easy to take for granted. That was someone that that um, certainly helped along the way. And I would say that uh, Cicchelli and his earlier book, so I think it was one of his, it might have been the third edition of the uh, Compensating the Salesforce. Those, that one, while it's a reference guide, was helpful in uh, appreciating appreciating the multiple ways of compensating people and and to build on what you said a lot of it was i benefited specifically from uh, an evolving business that grew through acquisition and had many different ways of of addressing revenue of procuring revenue and so that's where i had exposure to different types of roles different direct sales and direct sales resellers and kind of the ability to have that exposure right was a big was a big component with some i would say those two external uh influences okay yeah we've actually had the opportunity to chat with Danya on the show i formerly worked with alexander group and, and no david and uh, we'll see if we can get him on and interview him as well. But yeah. uh, I'm sure when they hear hear that, that's going to bring a smile to both their faces. Because I think that that both Donya and David feel like they've contributed to the, you know, what I'll call a body of knowledge or the legacy of, of sales Absolutely. compensation, uh, for sure. All right. So you mentioned during the pandemic, reaching out to colleagues and peers and starting to have some some conversations, questioning the why behind a lot of things. You also mentioned a contrarian. I want to I want to maybe get back to that in a little bit uh, about commonly held uh, ideas that maybe you disagree with around sales compensation. But I think that the end product of that was that you wrote a book. Tell Absolutely. us a little bit about uh, that process and and uh, what did you learn throughout that that writing process? Yeah. So learned a lot. <laughs> there is, uh, it's like, so let me take a one step back, right? The opportunity that I had to advise the nonprofit was that they needed to hire their very first salesperson. And I was just working with the founder who did not have any appreciation or perspective on sales, right? So I was just advising him pretty much every step of the way of the, like, what kind of roles do we hire? What do we need? Right. So, you know, talking about a job description, what are the, what are the characteristics that we would need to document? Uh, what kind of function when I'm looking at your market that you need to potentially uh, address that market with, right? So, so it's like, we have a demand we have uh, this need. We believe sale a sales function is what is required, and then how do we compensate that person in order to accomplish that desired outcome? That in the act was a big part of the I believe that there's lots of people who would benefit from this concept, right? And I and I kind of feel that way about small organizations, regardless, right? Whether that's nonprofits or 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 small businesses, right? Something like. I think it's something like 99% of all in the U.S. anyways, employers are less than 500 employees, right? And that represents something like 60% of workers. So somewhere in that ballpark. And the, it's like the greatest, the, peop, the greatest people with the greatest need are the ones who can't afford necessarily access to the, to the most expensive uh, advisory or, or guidance that would get them to where they desire to be. So with that, I believe that there was a need to uh, take an approach that's very tactical. So understanding budget is probably a problem. There's going to be difficulty in, in having the clarity of a compensation philosophy or any of those other underlying components that might be missed uh, just because they haven't they don't have enough employees to kind of get to that point, right? And there's There's not been a need when you have like 10 employees, you're not going to be dabbling with something that is that uh, ethereal uh, as compensation philosophy. It's, uh, I got a job, I can pay this, there you go, right? Like, that's just what it is. Uh, so that is what drove me to that process of, of trying to spend the time to write the book. Now, the act of writing, that into itself is a very um, interesting exercise of discipline. And 
uh, an opportunity to really uh, test out the idea that you, you may have. The funny thing is when you get to the conclusion, right, when you actually like launch it, there is a, at least for me, I don't know about other people, but I see everything in a book now. So everything I have in terms of an idea or, or what have you all, it's like, it's like that uh, old analogy, you know, that uh, uh, everything looks like a nail when all you have is a hammer, right? There's, there's a little bit of the, like, everything looks like, okay, I think that could be a book or right? this idea, right? And I'm so, it's, it, there's a bit of a, an accomplishment that goes, that goes to that, that I think re removes a, a filter of what you can't believe that you can do. And so that, that has helped me immensely because since then, or since that book, I have a follow-up book that's that's focused on pay transparency, and then a um, a workbook that's actually uh, going up for presale in January. And so that's it's transformed my ability to to think about what is possible candidly. I saw an an interview with two authors, Stephen King and George R. R. Martin. Stephen King, one of the most prolific writers of our at least my generation. I think I might be a little bit older than you. And then George R. R. Martin. Uh, you know, his, his famous Song of Ice and Fire, uh, he mm -hmm. struggled, right, to complete uh, his right. book series. And, you know, Martin asked S Stephen King, you know, how do you do it? And Stephen King came back with, a, I'll probably butcher this quote, but he said, I write six pages a day, day in, day out. And, and George R. R. Martin was almost stunned, you know, at this response. And I thought about that. I said, that is a lot to write. You know, I, I try to write the occasional blog post or, or short form article. And it it's definitely, I think, a learned skill. Did you have any personal goals for yourself in terms of a pace or a timeline? How did, how did you get it done? Yeah. I set completely unrealistic expectations for myself to start off with. Completely unrealistic, right? And uh, then I followed that up with blocking time every morning to just focus on these small steps. So I, I do believe it's like building disciplines in life translate in other areas. And in this case, I blocked 15 minutes and I, I said uh, 15 minutes of creative time. And so in this case, if that's writing and it so prompts me, especially when I was writing a book, I focused on that because I thought that if I could, I could just block 15 minutes, then that'll translate into uh, something else or it'll all go beyond it. And if I'm in the flow, then it'll be something where I'm just, I'm working it. Right. And I can accomplish a lot in, in 15 minutes. And sometimes it's a dud. So I focus on, you know, audible or reading something in that same time, because what usually seems to happen, at least for me, the more I read, the more I listen, uh, the more interesting creative ideas come to me. And so that's a big component that I have found. The more I try to educate myself on self, and it doesn't even matter what it is. It could be some, something completely just different. And you're like, okay, I can see something that I didn't see before because I connected something, right? I, I've been able to produce an, an idea or a concept in a way that just looks different. Uh, so I definitely agree with that, uh, that approach. But I also find for me, a lot of it is also, I, I like to fly and try to write one at, at that point in time because it is non-distracting time. So I don't have anything on. I just pull out, like try to pull out the, you know, the, the little thing, lean over and just try to write because it's such an ideal time to, to try to be as disconnected as possible from, well, everything, <laughs> everything all of the time. That's so yes, that's, it's been very helpful. And I think it's, um, Stephen Pressfield does a similar approach of the start with one word, okay. What you find is if you just put in the one word, a second usually appears and then you go from there. Totally different line of thought, but I think, you know, recently in the news and on social media, it'd be hard to miss, uh, the discussions around AI. And I think the most recent, I think chat GPT, hope I'm getting that right. Do you think that's going to make it harder? easier for a book writer? Is it another tool to use or is it a competition? I think that it's going to be an interesting, it's going to be an interesting thing because it means we can push out more content more quickly, but I think quality content is still a little bit of a moment away uh, technologically, right? So I think that there's the, those things. So it's like, we can put out lots and lots of content and blogs. So if we want to need to play the game of quantity, boom, AI does that. 
But if we want creativity or quality, I still think that's a little bit of a, probably a couple years away. It, I mean, that's the thing about AI. It, it's it's going to be learned algorithms, right, of the way in which people want to consume. So I think that's going to be a competition to your point in that you can write new books, especially small ebooks, right, that will give people what they need or desire to read. And I think a very tactical and subject-oriented method, right? But I do think that editing will still be required. And I still think that that sort of final walkthrough of, is this meaningful for people? Does this add value to people's lives? I don't think that AI is there. And I think that'll take some time to really make it a worthwhile competition. Okay. I think that leads into the next thing I wanted to ask is this, one of the things I say a lot, so people probably, you know, the people that, that have heard me or talked to me on the phone would probably at some point in time heard me say that common practice is rarely best practice. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of what people find around sales compensation when they do a quick Google search is common practice, right? Uh, maybe it's a sales leader or a CEO saying, well, here's what I've seen. Here's what's, you know, at different companies. Right. And people and people put, you know, put a, a halo or or expert bias around they're good at one thing. They must be they must be knowledgeable about another thing. But I've also seen, you know, talking to a lot of companies over the years, you see kind of some some repeating themes or patterns, and people want benchmarks, they want to know what everybody else is up to. I think the longer I do this, the more I'm like, uh, why do you care what everybody else is up to? Uh, type of thing. But you mentioned right? That you have some contrarian views. You like to challenge the status quo. What types of common practices uh, would you say maybe aren't best practices and you would give people different advice around? Yeah. I would say there's, there's probably two that immediately come to mind. One is figure out a way to make sure that you have a clear culture and interweave it wherever possible into your plan. And when I say plan, that is everything that that encircles that. Uh, and this is the approach that your, 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 your leadership takes. It is in the plan document wherever possible. Like what is our purpose, our mission, and our, our, our values that we want to act upon? And, and oh, by the way, we want our customers to feel on a daily basis from us. It's that sort of thing. And the, guess, and the, the reality of that is it has to be different for every company. So this is the contrarian, a little bit of the contrarian perspective. You can't take a job description and you can't take an old plan, dust it off and say, this will work because it needs to be distinct and unique to you and your strategy at this moment in time. And after your strategy changes and after this year changes, it's out the window. You have to look at these things to address specific needs of your organization at that moment in time, because we all know the world changes. So we need to make sure that we keep up with it rather than a once one and done, because that just, it just doesn't, it just doesn't play out that way. It doesn't, it doesn't work in the long run. And then the other one is math matters more than benchmarking. And so in this case, and this is why I appreciate more of the small business approach is the, uh, if you can't afford median, or you can't afford best practice, then you just have to figure out another way to address what it is that you can offer uh, to bring on the right person who lines up with what it is that you're trying to accomplish for your organization. And because that is reality for most every organization that is, that, that is not the really big players, right? what you have to do is do something that is almost necessarily not common, right? In order for you to stand out, which means you have to think creatively to address that. And kind of in this case, not exactly act the way that everybody else does. That's the part where I feel like it's okay to be different. In fact, it's so much better to be distinct and to be different because you have to be. You can't, you don't have the dollars in many cases to be like the everybody else. And oh, by the way, as soon as you, become vanilla like everybody else, then what exactly do you stand for? And what exactly do you go and pursue? And how do you differentiate yourself in the marketplace? It's all of those things. It's it's uh, those of taking a little bit of a different approach entirely or a different stance, I think is exactly what you want to do in order to stand out. So my quick takeaways from that, corporate context and then corporate culture matter. 
right? When it comes to the design of the sales compensation plans. You said something else that actually, you know, one of those light bulb moments for me where I'm like, I never really thought about it that way. And I don't know, for the folks that are listening that maybe aren't familiar with the idea of pay benchmarks and the quartile and the median, can you explain that real quick? And then I'll follow up with the question I had. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in this case, uh, what is common practice in, in broad-based compensation is a review of a job description or job content. So essentially it's the, the key areas of responsibility, right? And in sales, we're looking at uh, base pay. Uh, we're also looking at variable pay, the total, total target cash, which is in most cases, the sum of the base and the variable, but also potentially allowances. So if there's car allowances and other stuff, right? Uh, in this case, what most companies do is they they have a compensation philosophy, which kind of says these are the things that we're pursuing when we when we acquire labor, right? And me, and most everybody looks at the median, so that's the fiftieth percentile. As um, as as was shared is you're usually in the twenty fifth, the fiftieth, and the seventieth, seventy fifth. That's you're you're kind of looking for the working within a range of pay. And that includes the variable or the the variable, the base, and, and that total target comp. Okay, so uh, this, and this was kind of the moment for me, right? Because I've I've definitely talked to people again around this idea of, of building a, a competitive moat, you know, around top performers via pay, and maybe having a differentiated pay philosophy for top performers versus median performers, right. and maybe even want to, you know, you're starting at that median. But when you're modeling out for your top performers, maybe you're targeting the 90th percentile, right? Absolutely. To try to create no. the competitive mode. The, what you said, though, is this idea of, you know, not, stat, not statistically perfect way to think about it because it's the median, not the mean. But half the folks in reality are going to be below the median because that's the way it works. And these are the people that have to get a little bit more creative because they're still trying to recruit talent into their organization. And that's a really interesting problem. You know, we talk a lot about this idea that sales compensation, maybe it's self-funding and you want to put money towards it and definitely, you know, protect your top performers. I haven't heard a lot of discussion out there for the company that doesn't feel like they can afford to be at the medium point, but still has an obligation, right? To the board, to shareholders, to employees, to investors, to, to try and do well. And so that's an interesting thought. And I hadn't really thought about this idea of what are the people beneath the median? How do they compete? Yeah, I think that's that's part of the practical reality of, well, what other levers do I have, right? Because to your point, you're exactly right. And then that's also true with like pay transparency broadly, right? You have a range and that means that there's going to be people lower and people higher. Not everybody's going to be making the exact same thing. And they shouldn't. They actually should not. And in this case, in, in terms of sales compensation, we are talking about, okay, so maybe cash delivery. Um, we're talking about maybe lower targets. We're talking about the upside potential, right? What are the other levers that I can I can pull? Because we're talking about both target compensation and actual pay as well, right? So when, when we go and pull the survey data, we're looking at the targeted pay and we're looking at the actual pay as well. And so sometimes right? The different companies can approach it in different ways to say, okay, can we accelerate our cash, but we can't pay as much at target. So maybe there's, maybe there's ways that we can at least look better than our competitors and methods to address that. Or we have shorter, shorter timeframes of performance measurements. So people can get to accelerators more quickly, right? Uh, Versus our competitors who just have annual plans. So it's, you're trying to figure out how to creatively solve for, for what is genuinely your, your business challenge of attracting yeah. late, uh, you know, talent, right. But it's also retention and motivation over time. All right. Next topic. So you mentioned not-for-profit, which I think for me is fascinating. I hope for people on the phone as well as fascinating, because I don't typically think around a sales or selling role for not-for-profit right. though. When right. you said it, I'm like, oh, maybe they're in fundraising type of thing. What sort of selling jobs are are there in the not-for-profit arena? And what are some primary measurements or metrics that uh, are used? Yeah. So it, it is an interesting thing because there can be all of the same type of, of sales functions. There's definitely the, the, the folks who are, are calling for corporate and or consumer donations, right? We have those, but they also do events. 
They sell, uh, they sell all kinds of tangible items in a similar way because that's the way in which it funds uh, the nonprofit. They're the particular group that I supported was uh, trying to essentially contract the pharmaceuticals to be recycled. Uh, and so they would be di they would be calling the, you know the big players of the third parties, the uh, the CVSs and the Walgreens of the world, right? But then also the, all of the mom and pop uh, type of far local pharmacies. And then also um, hospitals and health systems and uh, nursing homes, uh, you know, post-acute. So your, your acute and post-acute settings where they had uh, these pharmacies because their, their mission was to, to convert essentially unused uh, prescriptions to uh, then be available at low, low income or free clinics, right? And so the selling activity was essentially going pursuing these contracts. Uh, with these vendors and placing that repository for the recycling, right, in each of those facilities. So with the sales, right, is is a, with the intent of collecting a certain amount of revenue with these resale and getting in so, and fulfilling this mission. So it's it's still very much the same as what can be available, right, the tangibles, as well as uh, training and services type types of arrangements. I. I'm sure they're out there. I haven't seen too many software, so I haven't seen a SaaS nonprofit, but I'm sure they exist in terms of opportunities of, of what it is that can um, uh, be impactful for the world, right? Because in many cases, it's simply like their mission is nonprofit, but what they sell might be a traditional uh, product or service. Got it. Thank you for that. I think one last topic, and then there's two questions that I asked every guest on the show, and I think that'll bring us to the end of our time together today. Last topic. So pay transparency, mm -hmm. uh, the second book. When I think about pay transparency, I think there's a, a wide range of what companies do. Everything from super secret, you know, don't don't ask, you know, the, right. anybody else what they make to to companies that share, you know, top to bottom, very publicly what everybody in the company uh, makes. Have you, is there one that is there trends? What's more effective? Do you have a, a personal belief in, in which side of that? continuum company should live yeah it's tough right it's it's and it's 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 such an interesting thing because i think it's that much more complicated with the diversity of the population and i mean that globally uh geographically um just as much as our traditional our traditional yeah. um senses of oh, oh, like generationally yeah. yes exactly like and on and on right because i tend to think of there's both periods of education, periods of experience, that there's reasons and justifications for why people are paid differently. And again, they ought to be, right? There isn't a good reason to pay everyone one amount when all of us are different, literally by definition. And the interesting thing is I do believe that more companies are going to that more full transparency, um, simply because at a certain point in time, it's a lot easier, right? The defending yourself as to why you're secretive is much more challenging, especially when states are essentially saying, but you can't be, right? You have to share when somebody asks. And okay, fair enough, right? And so the the necessary adaptive part, at least in the United States, right, is, is that you're probably going to see more and more of that, especially in pockets. So smaller employee, employers who are geographically aligned to, to like the, the, everyone is in one state, or one city or one office. Okay, that's a lot easier, right? But I think the, the most important component is we need to make sure that people are more comfortable having conversations about compensation, right? The, and that means leaders, companies, and, and employees need to have a, gr a greater appreciation for what makes up their pay, why they're paid a certain way, and why it's okay that there is space. Right. And I and I think of myself when I first started out, I worked for the state of North Carolina for a period of time and you they post those ranges. Right. And you're trying to figure out, OK, so I was hired at this. Now, why exactly was I hired at this? And what is my formula? Right. For how to move onward and upward. And ideally, we are having conversations with people to talk about when well, you acquire this skill, you you perform in this way and you de develop you develop yourself in these either soft or hard skills. And this translates into progression. And if without 
without essentially the the one, it's real hard to have a conversation about the other, right? Because it is kind of like reward and and path to reward, very much very much like sales sales compensation in this case, where it's a little clearer, right? Do these things, perform in this way, and you you are compensated appropriately, and it's on paper, and it's and here it is, and we give it to you once a year, right? When we talk about your career and the 20 year plan or whatever it is, 40 or 50, right? We tend to have much more of a difficult time talking about uh, the way in which we connect those rewards with the behaviors and actions that we desire for people to take on, to take on board. So I think that the visibility will drive the need to have to like catch up on the rest of rest of that formula, if you will. Right. So I, th- I, I believe that's, that's probably where, where we're headed. Actually, I actually have two two quick follow up questions. One okay. is, you know, one problem I see a lot of companies or you know fall into is the and I think the term is pay compression, where mm-hmm. you get hired on at a particular salary in twenty twenty two. Somebody gets hired into the same role two three years down the road, and the market has changed. Maybe there's been some wage inflation, and they have to hire that person, maybe who's less experienced, less right. credentialed you know, at a higher rate just to get them in the organization. Does pay transparency help or hurt with this? It could help over time. It will require companies to have to be more adaptive and anticipate that that's, that, that transparency will, will uh, drive that behavior. And I think there's the two, two parts to this is, is one, there's the absolutely possibility of the evolution of the range, right? So their guidance publicly, right? will have to grow. And then that person's going to raise their hand and be like, you know, are we going to do something about this? And they should, the company should be conscious of that very, very proactively because they don't have a choice now, right? Uh, Then there's the other side of the, what creative approaches are we going to take so that we either give a really, really wide range, right? Or we are going to do something that differentiates the jobs at each rung to account for differences uh, amongst that employee population. And I think you, we, you, we might see a little bit of a mixture of both uh, because I think companies are going to have a really hard time with the 10% and, you know, plus inflation and the impact of real wages that are actually, you know, still far behind from the many decades of 3% increases. Right. The reality is that people that have been employed in in a company for a very long period of time are probably making less than the people who just joined. And that's not new. But now all of that's going to be publicly uncovered. Well, what what is there to do? And there there are going to be people that are going to probably take uh, the uh, hey, we just have to pay it. And then there's going to be the others who are going to be like, well, how can we creatively hold this off? For a couple more years while we figure out an alternative because we can't afford it. Yeah. I think I saw a recent survey. So I always say, take it for what it's worth. I don't know the sample size and, and bias and, and all the demographics of a survey, but I think, you know, uh, but a rough indicator of what's going on. I saw that, uh, you know, the pool for merit pay increases in 2022 for to going into 2023, uh, you know, historically somewhere around 3%. Uh, right. Closer to four, three point nine was what this particular survey had had indicated. So, yep. uh, you know, some catch up uh, to be done to the inflationary rate. All right, final two questions that I like to ask everybody that comes on the show, and and you may have already answered these, but we'll we'll see. Uh, the first one is: Who in the world of sales compensation would you most like to take out to lunch? So interesting enough, I am a I am a student of sales. As well, so I consider myself someone who pays attention to the, the literature that's out there, and I think it might be at the moment it might be uh, Anthony Anthony Anarino, um, might be the it's like either that or Todd Capone, but those are the those are the two at the moment um, in terms of sales. In terms of sales comp, it might actually it might be Danya simply because I I wouldn't mind having a, a lunch. Uh, uh, again with uh, with Donnie, it's been a, been a few years. All right. Second question: As you can tell, I, I sit and work in a library. 
I really enjoy reading books. Yeah. Maybe more so recently, electronic versions of books and, and the paper copies. Is there a book that you would recommend right now? And it could be one of your own uh, that people <laughs> should go read uh, around sales compensation or, or, or again, general sales. So I'm I'm audible. I do more audible candidly uh, because I feel like I can almost filter. So it's funny because I, I listen first. And then if it's like, if it gets through that first filter, I go get the book and then I read it. It's just kind of one of those things um, that, uh, that I, um, it was an app that gives a condensed. So it, it's actually version. just reads, it just, it just reads, reads, right? Okay. So it's kind so Kindles, it's just the audio book, right? That's, that's all it is. So it, it's Amazon's, um, now I like, I like, um, and there's a couple of them, uh, but I, I like it's Mark Hunter's book on i think it's called a mind for sales and i and mind i kind of don't, i i do uh, yeah a mind for sales and i i mind like that yeah i yeah. like that one simply because it again looks at the underlying components it's kind of like old zig ziglar if you're familiar with that of the mm -hmm. like what are the things that you need to know if you're going to sell and really think about the tasks and the behaviors and the disciplines uh, that's why i kind of like a Jim Rome and, and others like that, that are a little bit of the personal development approach to being as successful in whatever you do. Because I, I, what I appreciate more so in, in, after my years in sales compensation is that there, the process and steps of a say of, of sales can be analogous to so many aspects of our lives, right? If we're trying to communicate something, we're trying to get convince people of a particular opinion or or share whatever it is that we have, whatever our skill set is, or or we're trying to go and get a decision made, right? In our opinion, we, we still have to understand the psychology of those other people to influence others, right? To act in in our direction or to agree with us or to at least back us. And I think a lot of that comes from a, an appreciation for, for the act of selling, uh, which I, you know, I tend to believe is, is kind of the, the, the backbone for, for, you know, for all economy, right. Without that, where would we be? Right. No, I think, uh, Mark Hunter is great. I followed him for a number of years now uh, on LinkedIn. I love his, uh, short form videos. I haven't taken any of his classes, but he was pivotal for me. One of the first times I had to carry a really big bag, you know, the idea of a lead gen, a little bit foreign to me. And again, I'll paraphrase something he said at one point in time was the, if you feel like you need to make a call, you probably already should have made it right. So you better right. pick up the phone and call it. And he also something along the lines of you can learn more in five minutes talking to somebody than you can in two, three hours of researching, uh, you know, on the web. So again, pick up the phone and make that connection. And so uh, yeah, and yeah, I happen yeah. I happened to, to have the opportunity to meet him very very briefly last year. So I, I it, there was a little bit of a like a moment of like yeah I know you right. I mean it was it was it was a, a great opportunity to just get a moment of of his time when uh, I uh, it was actually in like a hotel bar just like yeah I actually do know who you are right all right via the via reading your books and listening to your books type of thing. So I had a, I had a, one of those, one of those moments of, uh, of, uh, I am blanking on the word, but you know, good experience like that. All right, Chris, thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate you coming on the show. Very much enjoyed the conversation. I will let you get back at it. And once again, and to have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.